again, everyone. Welcome to our next edition of Local 148462's Digital Night School at the Hall program. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brian DeSaro. I'm the operations manager up at the local and a member of the organizing task force, the group that specifically brings you this education programming. In previous recordings, we've addressed issues like mental health, addiction, and changing technology during this pandemic. Um, during our internal discussions with the organizing task force, one area we saw a great need uh, to bring to the forefront of the discussion is what the future for music educators specifically looks like. Um, many musicians, union and not, are also music educators in some form or fashion. Um, so today we have three panelists joining us um, that have been kind of on the forefront of these changing circumstances and they can kind of speak to how we can better prepare for what's coming our way this fall. Um, so to start with, I want to give a big shout out. Thank you to you guys for joining us. Um, first up, we have Karen Burr. So I'll let you give a brief introduction for yourself. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and thank you for arranging this very important topic. I think I, we can all agree on that. I'm Karen Burrs, and I'm the director of strings at the Galloway School uh, in Atlanta. I also teach um, music electives and um, work with string students throughout the Atlanta and uh, Columbus, Georgia area, actually. And um, I am here as uh, 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 speaking um, for uh, class ensembles uh, and keeping music relevant uh, in a school situation where it is inevitable that there will be online learning uh, next school year and what ideas uh, we can start thinking about to keep our music programs in the schools relevant. Yeah, and I think that's going to be a great addition to our conversation today. Um, another person that's kind of been on the forefront that we have gotten many compliments come through our office for is Jeannie Carreri of Career Music. Um, so I'll let you talk a little bit about who you are and what you've kind of done during this pandemic so far. Sounds good. Thank you, Brian. Um, yep, I'm Jeannie Carreri uh, with Carreri Music. We're kind of a small music store, but mostly a specialty shop. But we also do a lot of lessons. And of course, when pandemic hit, um, we had to quickly change into all virtual lessons, just like everyone else, in order to stay um, open and uh, you know just stay in business in general. So we went through a lot of changes, and of course, I'm also a musician and in the community. So it was imperative as we were all dealing with the loss of concerts and work and that kind of thing, to kind of work together with colleagues and come up with something that would maybe is something everyone can do uh, that is interested in teaching uh, during this downtime. So what what we started off as, you know, our little music studio, just it, it didn't necessarily grow into something big, but it, there was a great need for it. And uh, I didn't waste any time. So we just kind of went right into it and tried to help as many people as I could, as well as save my own business. So that's what we did. And Along the way, you kept many, many musicians working as well and bringing in some money from their studios. Yeah, correct. Um, and the next up, we have Avril Taylor um, of Atlanta Music Project. So we're happy to have you here to kind of teach, or not teach, but to tell us a little bit about teaching some larger ensembles through digital learning. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, and so I guess an introduction um, as it pertains to this topic, um, is that the Atlanta Music Project, um, we just finished an online series, which was about four weeks long. Um, and we did a lot of different types of classes within, the, within this four week series. So we had daily master classes. Um, and then we had group classes daily as well. Um, and so in addition to this, we would do a weekly webinar for nonprofits and the arts. And this was open to the public. Um, and we also did weekly podcasts. Um, and on the podcast, we would do in-depth interviews um, with special guests on various topics um, pertaining to music. Um, and this was also open to the public. Um, we did a symposium for our kids um, called The College Years. And let me push pause on this also. So we're we're an organization with a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, we're actually a small organization, but 
we have a team that that is tackling these issues so uh, that's how we're able to offer all of these um, all of these different formats during during this time and we did it pretty quickly um, so in the symposium um, this was called the college years um, and these were various college prep topics um, about what life is like as a music major um, and how to nail a college audition and how to nail a college interview. Um, and then in addition to that, we have a private lessons program within the Atlanta Music Project and this is called the AMP Academy. Um, and the AMP Academy is um, you get a one-on-one -on -one lesson with um, an instructor weekly and then uh, we have juries and um, recitals throughout the year. And you have to audition to get into this program. Um, and so we were able to take the AMP Academy online as well. Um, and the formats that we used were Zoom, um, WhatsApp, and we used FaceTime. Um, so that's a general description of, of kind of what we've done um, up to this point. And now we're preparing to do a, a summer series, which will be um, a three week online program as well. Um, and then one thing I should also say about the Atlanta Music Project um, is that we are a nonprofit um, and that our mission statement is to empower underserved youth to realize their possibilities through music. And Avril, you mentioned having a team kind of behind the scenes helping move some of this along, but y'all have a wide range of programs, not just for instrumentalists, but choir students and all that as well, that's tied to kind of an after school program with Fulton County Schools. Is that correct? Um, Atlanta Public Schools. Atlanta so Public schools. so yeah. y'all had a very quick turnaround on when y'all started your online versus when schools kind of shut down at the start of this. Yeah, it was a pretty quick turnaround and it was a lot of, a lot of learning on the fly. Um, and I would say just to describe um, the programs that we offer, we have the after school component and that's open to, that's open to anyone. Um, but we have a partnership with the city of Atlanta um, and that allows certain schools to be able to um, have transportation um, to our facil facilities. But the after school program is open to, to anyone. Um, and then we have a youth orchestra and a youth choir um, and those programs are audition only. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And we did online programming for all, all of those components. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you to all three of you again for being here. Um, I know y'all have done a great deal of work the last three months. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot of work ahead of us, but hopefully some people can take some pieces of advice from this session um, and apply it to their own studios or lessons. Um, so Karen, I wanted to start with you, um, kind of started talking about uh, private studios and staying relevant and thinking ahead. Um, so with the current circumstances, um, not knowing what's coming our way um, next fall, let alone next week, um, what should people who are either already doing online lessons or planning to implement some kind of digital lessons in the future, um, what contingency plan should they uh, be thinking about to stay relevant, retain that value of their lessons to satisfy both the students and the parents, um, and still also kind of keep their finger on the pulse and remember that this is a human situation um, and that there can't be such strict parameters around everything? Well, the one thing that Jeannie and Averill and I have in common up to this point is um, when the um, blank hit the fan <laughs> in March and everybody had to go home, we had to come up with plans really quickly. And, you know, we were in a situation where we were throwing things in the wall, you know, see what sticks, um, uh, you know, the, the turnaround that Jeannie had with immediately gathering um, mu musicians who not only were out of a job, jobs, uh, but, you know, were an asset in teaching and, and organizing them, you know, in, in this almost, you know, unhuman <laughs> speed. Uh, and I think we are all suffering the hangover from that now. 
<laughs> uh, I know I am. But the summer is giving us some time to think. Um, those of us who um, are not working so much in the summer, not teaching so much, or are, look, are planning for a new school year, uh, we have some time to think about what is inevitably going to be a broken up year. Um, concerts that usually happen in the winter when flu season is going to be the greatest and there's a bigger chance of us all going home. Um, do we even plan concerts? Do we start now thinking about alternatives? What will that look like? Uh, how do we deal with students' disappointment at not being able to play a concert? Uh, many of us experience the uh, in the spring preparing and students working very hard uh, to produce concerts that got canceled. Um, I would avoid those situations if at all possible and be realistic about what we can do in this coming year. Uh, it's not going to be a normal year. Uh, I think things will get back to normal, but I don't think next year is going to be normal. We need to plan for that and and I think that that happens, uh, we can approach it from four different ways. Um, the biggest way I think is building community. Students, children learn best when they feel safe, when they are in an environment for, that they feel love. And that's really hard when you're online. So uh, we have to think about how we're going to build community with students um, of all ages. I'm particularly thinking of younger students and beginners. Um, what is that going to look like? Uh, I had good luck with technology um, uh, like Flipgrid and, um, and, and, and games and contests and things that might not have anything to do with music, but have a way of taking the pulse of your students. What are they feeling like? Remember that if they're working at home, they could have relatives. They could have, uh, they could have relatives that are sick. They could have siblings they have to take care of. They could have uh, only limited use of computers. Um, so we need to think about making allowances for all of that um, and just continually take the pulse of your, of your students. Surveys are good. Um, uh, individualized instruction is a big um, plus, actually, I found in, in teaching online. You can individually address the needs of, of students a little better than, than in a group. So that is a, actually a plus. Um, the second thing is technology. Um, I mentioned Flipgrid. We're on Zoom now, and there's a cool feature with breakout rooms that we used a lot um, uh, that, you know, you can divide kids into smaller groups and bring them back in. And of course, them recording and submitting um, assignments. We use the Google Suite, um, but there are other ways to do that. And then finally, um, incorporating composition and um, with, pro with programs like GarageBand or BandLab or MuseScore, all of those are really helpful in students being able to express themselves, not necessarily uh, all together in a group. Um, the, set, the third thing is the concert performance alternatives I was talking about before. Um, some ideas that I'm already thinking of coming up with are albums in lieu of, um, in lieu of concerts. So um, putting together an album of different genres and uh, students contribute their track um, on a click track. Um, I'm the clearinghouse for that, and I put it all on, I use Logic, but you can use any uh, digital audio workstation, uh, and you know, do, do the editing. Uh, this is a time for kids who enjoy editing music projects to step up and help. And then also videos are really great. Um, so a student will record the audio and then record video for the, for the song um, outside or in a room with candles or wearing whatever they like or you have everybody wear the same thing and they're all doing it from their homes. And then your kids who like editing an iMovie or a QuickTime um, can help you and have fun with that too. So again, you're building community and you know, we, we have technology, we can share back and forth and everybody can, can share and participate. It doesn't have to be the teacher doing all of this. Um, and this is something uh, you had done in your studio this past spring, correct? Yes, we put together um, the Bach Air, the Bach Air. Uh, and so students submitted an audio and they also submitted a separate video we thought it was appropriate for the times. It was a timely piece for what we were all thinking and going through. 
and the individuality of each student shown through in how they recorded their video. And I, I thought it was a very worthwhile project and something for the school uh, in general to, to archive. Um, on, um, can, should I stop talking? Uh, no, continue. I think you're going into point four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So point four. Oh, um, yeah. I, can I also mention um, outdoor or porch concerts? Um, so small groups will probably be accessible and permissible. So uh, uh, think, think outdoor neighborhood concerts um, where people can drive up their cars and listen. Um, that's also community building as well. And then the last thing is opportunities for enrichment and well-rounded musicianship that you kind of take, you kind of get pushed to the side when you're having to rehearse for a concert. So rhythm exercises, working with rhythm grids, um, singing and playing intervals, um, co com composing with, with GarageBand or BandLab or, or MuseScore, um, mentorship, giving back, older students making instructional videos for younger students. Um, so um, this is a, a, all a way to connect, um, to, to connect people, to make them feel like they're apart, uh, even though we're apart. Um, so uh, these are things we should definitely think about over the summer, but also I think it will enrich all of our music programs going forward. Um, whether or not we are together or apart. Yeah, because I, moving forward into the future, digital lessons are here to stay. I think that's something coming out of this is we will continue to have digital lessons when we are able to meet in person. Um, so kind of building off some of what, he, what you said, as you're looking at these different programs, switching things up, different touch points with students, um, what have you done or what would you recommend doing to kind of prepare your students for this new lesson experience? Well, I think every, every teacher, private teacher, classroom teacher, whoever, should set very clear expectations for lesson time. That means that you're on time, you get out of bed, you put on clothes, like you're coming to a class or a lesson, um, there are consequences for being late. There are consequences for missing and not sending an email. Um, and you set up very clear expectations up front. Uh, that was something that we had, we didn't have as much success with when we were, you know, going by the, flying by the seat of our pants. But now I know that it's very important that everything should be business as usual on that front. Um, so that's kind of helping keep your lessons on track and getting people prepared to show up and play. Um, but then you also talked about some enrichment things. So how do you reward students for things going well in that environment? Um, so, so rewarding students, um, you know, be creative. Um, you know, that if create formats to brag about them, um, you know, use social media. Um, you know, as, as, as many incentives. And, and the biggest one is, I mean, they get satisfaction from, pl from playing their instrument and being involved in a community. I mean, when we're all together in an ensemble, Avril and, and Jeannie, I mean, both, we all agreed that there's camaraderie, there's team, you know, there's this team building and teamwork. And if, they, if we have to create an environment where they still feel like they're part of the team, and that, that is the reward in, in, in playing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what we have to continue. We have to find yeah. a way to do that. Avril, on that topic, just while we're here, um, kind of that student to student touch points and connection, uh, team building, is there anything uh, you can add that Atlantic Music Project has had success with to keep the students uh, in communication with each other? Yeah, yeah, two things actually come to mind um, on that topic. Um, one is um, the students can evaluate and um, critique and make observations about other students' demonstrations. Um, and that's a good practice for them to be able to do that constructively. Um, and then another format that we've used, um, we have 
we had a session called Ask Us Anything About Music. Um, and that was just, so there was no, well, there was playing in the class, but it was voluntary. So a, a student may volunteer to perform something um, for the group on Zoom. And then um, the, the teachers in the class would give some feedback and the students would give feedback on their presentation. Um, but I, I can also remember a time when one of the kids asked at the end of, the, of a lesson, he was like, well, can we have time to stay on and just talk with our friends? And I was like, well, unfortunately, no. Um, so we, we couldn't give them all of the socialization that they wanted, but um, we were able to offer it in those formats though. And would you guys say that keeping that social aspect is something um, that would be helpful to keep students feeling like things are business as usual? Um, is that something that teachers should plan on preparing for in addition to their regular lesson plan? Absolutely. Yeah, I think if, if you have time, I think you you should take advantage of it because I know that um, I know that that's an area that I'd like to be able to do more of is, is listening to the students and, and have them really like go around the circle and have them express themselves and get used to doing that. But um, we're so limited in, in our time. Um, when we're together. So maybe that's one of the things that we can capitalize on with these online lessons. Um, but it all, it all depends on the time that you have. So yeah, and I think that's just going to be kind of a thing we learn as we go through it, moving yep. forward, how to keep that balance. Yep. Um, Jeannie, I want to move to you. Um, as we mentioned, you had onboarded from the start, quite a lot of musicians fairly quickly into um, moving their studios to a digital format and keeping their lessons moving forward. Um, so I guess, what can you speak to from the business side of a private studio for someone that maybe has just been doing, you know, emails with parents and Venmo payments and cash payments, how do they manage a private studio business? Um, moving forward into this kind of new era that we're in? Um, well, from my experience, um, some things that obviously changed inside the music store is obviously we weren't seeing anyone face to face. So where I would see them and every night and they would pay, you know, directly here uh, with no one being here, you had to quickly come up with something. And of course, everyone's first reaction is, well, you can do Venmo and PayPal, and those have been very helpful, of course. But another thing that I quickly learned, especially because uh, in adding new teachers, is that I had to really util utilize a QuickBooks Online um, because they have a very good invoicing system that you can use, and, and it allows the customer to pay by credit card or however they want. If, and it just makes it really convenient. You just have to keep a good trail and communication from the teacher to me to as far as the projections of lessons and then then to the customer and, and how to how to bill it strategically and that kind of thing. So that was all very new because um, we really just saw people face to face. They pay when they come. It was it was, you know, one and done and you, you wait till next week. And, um, you know, I had to now communicate with not just the teachers, but the parents. Um, and I really went down to just myself as a staff person. So it was, it's a lot of communication between teachers and the parents, and not to mention uh, my own students. So uh, that, was, that was an interesting challenge, but I learned really quickly that the, the QuickBooks Online really did have a great system for that. And if you enable the credit card payments, it just makes your life a lot easier. Okay, um, and since we're on the topic of communication, I want to start with you and then throw this to the rest of the group. Um, you know, traditionally in person communication is very face to face, very easy. Uh, well, usually very easy. Um, but now as we're doing things like we're doing right now through the zoom call, um, you know, things can get lost in communication, it can be difficult to kind of do traditional music lessons in the format that they've been done. Um, as 
music educators start to plan um, for their digital lessons on a communication level. Um, we've already kind of talked about financials, but with parent communication, student communication, websites, lesson planning announcements, schedules, cancellations, I know that's a very wide umbrella, um, but how should people be strategizing from start into lessons and then afterward? How can they strategize their communication to keep things running smoothly? Well, uh, if you want, I'll start with that. Um, I think it really depends on the, the teacher. Uh, every teacher has a different opinion on how they're going to want to handle it. And I try to let them be individuals. Some people love to use an app that to like Tanara or something like that, that would do all this communication where the teacher can set their assignment and all that. And then some people are just uh, literally use the book, maybe scan the items, send, I mean, a little more old fashioned with it, but I think everybody has to use what they feel comfortable with. And, and really, I personally, for my own teaching, didn't change a whole lot that way. They had their books. If they need a new book, they get a new book. And we just kind of, it, it was almost best to keep it the same as it was face to face, except for we were through a screen. But other than that, the format really, I kept the same because they liked it. It was familiar and they had enough new things to learn. I didn't need to change the way we were doing things. They needed me to keep it familiar, so. So it's not always reinventing the wheel. Um, it can just be kind of fine tuning for some of these things. Um, would anything change for you if you were picking up a brand new student strictly for digital lessons? Um, no, I don't think so. I'm going to do like I just picked up today a student from um, Panama City Beach and we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to ask. Uh, she's going to tell me what book she has. I have copies of every book so it, it that's not and what I don't have I can get if I want her to change I can again refer her to, to get the book somewhere wherever she can um, and you know so no I don't I don't really think it's going to change too much going forward we we all have the ability to text and email and scan but those we will use those I don't need them to get something separate to do what I need them to do so it's not really going to change that okay um, and then Karen or Avril, for y'all, what have been some communication challenges or things, have things been rolling along as normal um, with communication on the business side of your education programs? Well, I, I like to totally agree with Jeannie in that keeping things as consistent as possible is the way to go. And uh, if things are working and the kids are comfortable with it, Again, they're going to learn better uh, if if they're you, you if they're doing what they've always been doing. And I think that's our responsibility as educators is to make it as easy for the students as possible. Um, and again, I think it's to to just set expectations. Um, you know, in 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 Jeannie's music school, the the individual teachers, you know, should set expectations or what they want um, also when they'll be available um, to ask questions uh, one problem we had in um, our, my cl in classroom situations is students you know who teenagers who don't start their day until noon and then they'd be calling teachers or emailing teachers at 10 11 o'clock at night asking questions that's not fair for the teacher because it turns our work day into 24 seven. And that doesn't happen when you go to a school and you come home. So there was a barrier that was broken when this happened. We have to take care of ourselves. And that is the other important part of this equation. So when you're setting up your guidelines and your expectations, also be realistic about when you are available to answer questions uh, and, and, and be firm in that. Um, especially in your classroom situation and you're giving grades, and this is what I'm thinking about. Um, and the students need to respect that just like they would respect office hours at school. So, so be consistent as much as possible and also set very 
um, set set expectations that everybody understands. And Avery, what were some of the expectations uh, that Atlanta Music Project uh, has communicated with both the students and with parents in the program? Um, I was I was actually thinking more about the communication. I, I'll get to the expectations in a minute. Um, but as as far as the communications, I would just add that um, we we you have to over communicate um, and. And then some of the parents, they may get a little bit tired of you, but some of the parents need to hear, and, and some of the parents are gonna miss the first couple of times. So we found ourselves, and, and in addition to over communicating, being careful with the links that you set up and, and just verify that the links are correct and you're sending out the correct link. So if you're, if, if you're building and all of a sudden you have a lot of different classes, you just wanna make sure about, about your links. Um, and so we would find ourselves just daily sending out texts and, and, um, emails, just making sure that people were ready to get on online on their classes. Um, and just keeping really, really detailed records so you can see who's not there. Um, so you can give them a nudge and that's just the way that we're set up. So all, all places may not be set up in that manner but we were set up where we did have the freedom where um, you can have someone that can go against the roster and see who's not there and then go check in and see um, did they forget or is, or is there a conflict. Um, and so as, as far as expectations that we set, um, it, so the AMP Academy, well, actually all of our classes, they were, um, we wanted, like they were strongly highly recommended but we didn't no one was forced to do the classes and that's because some people just don't have access to internet or some people may be sharing a computer but um even though we didn't in did force people to attend we had pretty good attendance so okay and were there any um missteps or things that you guys kind of fell into that you can advise people moving forward like hey this does not work do not do this um, and one thing that's jumping out at me is uh, you said over communicate uh, Avril and specifically with our office there is a communication gap um, that we see with members um, specifically through email um, where you know obviously not everyone is going to open every email you send out and not everyone is going to click those links um, so I can see making sure there's clear communication and the expectation is that you will keep up with this communication as well, um, as being something to set forth as you start these lessons. Um, but any other missteps or guidance that you guys can give on this? Well, I can say something when, when we first went into online learning, I was coming up with all of these grand ideas and, and yo, know, we could do this and then we could, you know, there's like all of this stuff. And then as the, as the weeks grinded on, I was like, there's no way this is gonna happen. <laughs> so um, our administration at Galloway was very wise in saying um, it, for, it, for our high school students, lower, cut your expectations in half. And, uh, and, and this was for a term. I mean, this was for a nine-week term they were talking about, not for you know like a, a week off uh, off campus. But and and you might need to cut them at, in half again. Uh, and I think that was probably the best advice that I received um, because you know we do what we can do, uh, and you know we'll have moments where that will be feeling that too. I mean, all of us as educators want to provide the best experience. And, you know, we want to make it better, you know, if it's not, uh, you know, if it's not good. And, you know, we just have to inject some reality in the situation um, and be creative about it. So I, I, I intend to do that moving forward. Okay, definitely. Um, I, I would throw out there, um, 
Um, don't, so as an instructor, um, what does not work is trying to play at the same time that, that doesn't seem to work. Um, and counting off a tempo doesn't seem to, to work either. So um, if, if this, just make sure that the student has a metronome on their own, a metronome tuner, and maybe you guys can sync by just having the same tempo markings. Um, but that was, that was a big thing for us, um, is that there's no group playing. So, so even in a group lesson, um, only one person is playing at a time. So. Yeah, and that's something that technology has not quite caught up with specifically for a music setting at this moment. Yeah, not um, yet. So, that's something we're still kind of struggling with to figure out what the best path forward with is. Um, maybe G five. Oh, go ahead. I, I said maybe five G will take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jeannie, with you, what are some of the challenges that you've gotten feedback from your uh, teachers with? Well, I was just going to kind of add to what they were talking about. One thing I learned kind of quickly is that. Um, and, and I say everyone, this includes the teachers and it also includes um, the parents, whether you're communicating with your teachers or the parents. Uh, everyone needs a little time, so they may take a little while in getting back to you. Um, and I think I just had to learn very quickly that everybody needed patience from everyone, um, especially from me, and just to, to understand that you know, one minute they're okay and one minute they're not um, because they're just digesting a, a lot. I mean, I had teachers coming to me that have been so busy in a playing career, they haven't updated their bio because they haven't needed to in five, seven years. They've been on the road and so busy and, and that's wonderful. But they literally, we had to sit, sit down and I mean, I could almost write their bio for them because I knew what they had done and that kind of thing, but they never had to do it. So just, just being patient and an understanding that we were all dealing with a lot of different things. And so that would be true of the musicians or teachers. It would be true of the parents because they're dealing with now schooling from home, dealing with the, ch the kids who are schooling at home. I mean, everybody had so much going on. So just, just being patient and, yes. and try to understand compassion for what everybody was going through and all the changes. <laughs> I, I would like to add for the record that is patience with everyone all around from the grocery store to everywhere else in life. Mm -hmm. uh, right now at this moment, we all need to practice some patience. Um, hey, Brian. Yes. Um, be patient with me. I, 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 thought, I thought of one more thing. Um, so, so there's a sound setting on Zoom. And so if, if you, um, so this was, this was a problem that we had early on is in having the lessons, if you play, like Zoom will stop a sound from a musical instrument. So in, in sound settings, if you go to audio settings and then you go to advanced and then if you if you disable both where it says suppress persistent background noise and disable suppress intermittent background noise let's see did you want to share your can you share your screen to yeah, I can. yep sure all right so is it coming up Yes. All right, so let's see if I can scroll through this easier. So, um, so if you click this tab under next to join audio, then click on audio settings, and then it takes you to, um, it takes you here. And so from this screen, click on advanced. And then under the advanced screen, you'll disable um, both persistent background noise and intermittent background noise. Um, and so that just gives much better 
um, a much better experience. You, you don't get the um, fading out in the end from Zoom. Okay, so that's for uh, like the actual noise coming through the sound coming through the computer, picking up instruments. Yeah, for like if, if you're playing an instrument without those settings for some reason, like Zoom just has those filters, so it'll stop the sound in the middle of it. So it'll be very displeasing. Um, you'll, you'll be playing for a minute, for a moment, it'll mute and then it'll come back okay. in with playing, so. Okay. Um, and Jeannie, I wanted to return to something you had said, um, talking about with this work stoppage, a lot of musicians are turning to uh, private lessons as kind of a revenue generator, a business to continue their lives for the time being until engagement start up again. Um, and I think for a lot of people that are making that transition and are kind of new to that, after a long time of not doing that, there's a lot of mental focus that that takes. Um, how would you go about kind of reassuring a musician that's coming in for the first time that, you know, this is possible, you can do this and, you know, let me help you move forward. Uh, strangely, I've had a number of people and these are just wonderfully accomplished musicians and they have had teaching, but they don't have maybe the confidence um, because they just haven't done it in a while. Um, but basically talk them through and just let them talk out a system, talk out a plan, some kind of strategic plan. Let them talk it out to me. If they can sell it to me or describe it to me, then they're, they're going to be fine. Um, so mostly it's, it's just that. And I, you know, I think people obviously have time and they can do it now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's frustrating because it's essentially learning a new job for them. Um, you know, a lot of us players were already teaching before, but some, some were not. So this is for those that weren't, this is kind of a new job and it's a lot to get used to. Um, but just checking in on them, letting, helping them kind of develop a system. I think is the best thing, a plan um, um, as to they share run, what they know. As they run that system by you to, as you said, kind of sell you on it, what are the things you're listening for um, to make sure they're kind of ticking all the boxes? Um, whether it's easy enough for anyone to understand. <laughs> and and as, as much as I, I know one area of, I know the, how to play the flute, I don't know how to play other instruments at all. So if they can make it to where I can understand it, then I feel, or, you know, a child can understand it. Obviously that that's the goal. Um, you know, I want them to feel good and confident about it. I know they're accomplished because I know their history or, or their abilities as players, but you want to make sure that they can articulate and identify with the, whoever they're teaching, whether it's an adult or a student. You know, there's two different two different things sometimes, and you, we want to make sure that they all you know agree. Okay, and then uh, Karen, is there anything you'd like to add? Kind of, if you're new to teaching, what are some of the boxes you would need to tick before uh, kind of going live with your program? Uh, I think Jeannie pretty much in, encapsulated it. Um, you know, patience is, be patient with yourself, um, and, uh, just keep the, keep a pulse on your students, um, have in there, there's a, there's a fine line between, you know, what you know they need to know and involving them with some of their choices. Um, so I would always ask students to take surveys of pieces they'd like to play, um, things they'd like to learn, uh, and incorporate that in teaching them their skills. One of the things to add, um, teaching helps you learn how to teach. So once you get started, you're teaching yourself what works and what doesn't. You just obviously, I mean, if, if I had waited till I thought I knew everything and I was ready to teach, I would have never started teaching. But as you go and as you develop your, you know, you start to develop your own systems. But I mean, it, it does help you teach. And, and, and the only way to really learn what works and what doesn't, and especially not just 
your views on what works, but what works for that personality of a child or adult, because that's all different too. You really have to listen to them, but mostly just um, understanding that everybody is different. Not everybody fits in a mold and you have to kind of get into it to see what works and what doesn't. It'll, you'll learn how to teach by teaching. Can, can I also say something else in that uh, teaching online is very, uh, can be very lonely. Uh, it usually when you are t at a music school and you run into other people, your colleagues, and you, te you, you talk about things and you talk about um, different students or different methods, you can ask questions. Um, but when you're at home is very solitary experience. And so I would encourage, um, you know, put music schools like Genie's or um, music departments, you know, in schools or, you know, music teachers at AMP to to have opportunities to talk with each other. If that means there's a weekly Zoom meeting, where right. all the teachers are coming together and they're just asking questions. Hey, how you doing? Um, you know, what, and, and get, get um, answers and solutions from each other. Um, that's, that's part of the community building as well. And we did do that initially. I had a, I had a team of about four or five of my original teachers that have been me with me right from the get go. And we would do zoom meetings to talk about what was working, what wasn't working right away to help um, other folks that maybe haven't ever done a virtual. So we did that. The other thing I've started and I want to continue to do is like do interviews with musicians. Um, from all over, and and the and the interesting thing about that, I think, to to piggyback off of what Karen just said, is, you know, people people are isolated. We're isolated now. We're not getting to. The, you're missing all the whole social aspect of your life. <laughs> For some of us, that was a, that's a big social piece, and, um, you know, the the interviews are a great way to connect and let them be heard and still connect with their colleagues and friends. So that's an important piece. And for private teachers who are not affiliated with music schools, um, you take the initiative to gather some of your friends who teach and, you know, get together. You can have meetings for free on Zoom for 45 minutes, right? Or, I mean, there are other, you could FaceTime each other or whatever, but, but take the initiative to, to connect with your fellow teachers and set regular lunch times um, where you, you can support each other. Yeah, and, and find, um, yeah, share resources with each other, um, find who's successful on your instrument, who, who's successful teaching a studio on your instrument and, and try to emulate what they're doing to see if some of those things work for you and, and take what works and, and throw away what doesn't. Um, and I would definitely say keep a log of, of each student and try to be detailed about what you're working on with, with each kid. Um, and then also just think about think about what you think is important to impart onto each student that you're that you're working with. So what is it that you that you think a good what is it that you think the lesson is for this kid and, and try to impart that as well. Um, so those are a couple of ideas to throw in there too. Yeah, and Avery with Atlanta Music Project, you have a lot of small groups and ensemble lessons, teachers that kind of overlap with each other, that work with your administrators. Um, what were some of the ways that you guys coordinated efforts to keep all the teachers on the same page and keep the pace of lessons up that you guys have maintained for almost three months now? Um, over communicating, <laughs> over communicating. And I think early on, um, Atlanta Music Project sent out to the teaching artists. They wanted to know ideas, uh, just different ideas. And they put together kind of like a think tank of different ideas. And then they sorted those out and, um, and then kind of came up with a skeleton for what the online program would be. Um, and then in doing the online programming, um, so the teaching artists would teach the classes and we would monitor the classes. Um, and so just really keeping track of what's going on in the classes and then offering feedback to the teaching artists um, and not being afraid to offer feedback to the teaching artists, not being afraid that they're going to be offended or, 
or anything like that. Um, and just just that over communication and, and if you see something that you you want to adjust um, mentioning it and and being being thorough about it um, that's that's how we got to eventually having um, the program being something that we were proud of and that the parents um, spoke highly of okay um, and then I have two kind of final questions I want to get each of your perspectives on. Um, I think everyone is going through the same thing right now where tasks that used to take 30 minutes are now taking an hour or two hours, or, you know, we're getting saturated to the point that, you know, we need to step away for a moment. So I think all three of y'all have kind of touched on things are taking longer, um, setting expectations on, lower uh, achievability, that might not be the best way to put it. Um, but as teachers, how do you keep yourself from this turning into a 24 hour a day job? Um, what, what limits do you need to set for yourself um, that you know I may have used to have five one hour lessons in a day and I, physically and mentally can't do that. So I need to change it to three. Um, how do you kind of judge where you need to take, take a step back and uh, take care of yourself for your own benefit, but also for the benefit of your uh, music lessons? If that question makes sense. Well, um I'll go back to uh, what I said briefly earlier about um, making limits um, and being realistic about what you can do. Uh, this, ha this situation has placed teachers uh, in particular in, in a really extraordinary uh, position and very vulnerable to burnout. And that's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be good for your family. It's not going to be good for your students. So you have to be realistic. And Brian, I think you, you touched on it um, about how many lessons you can teach a day, about what your after lesson office hours um, are going to be. And uh, you have to take care of yourself. You know, you put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Um, so uh, as much as you want to be there um, for that student who you don't want to lose, then you, all, you just have to set those, um, those boundaries. Um, and how many, you know, how many lessons can you realistically teach? Um, if you're assigning some kind of homework, how much can you realistically um, give feedback on? Uh, and just keep all of that in mind when you know you're going to have to set your own office hours your own work hours you know in this weird situation where you're at home all the time yeah burnout is the word exactly that i was looking for that couldn't come to my mind but i think that's a good point where before homework may have been everyone plays their piece and you give in person feedback now those are six recordings you have to listen to and you have to go back to find a timestamp and say at this timestamp, you did this, this is that feedback, uh, record it again, and then it's just adding all different layers of work. Right, and so when, uh, when you say, cut the, your expectations for your students in half, uh, not only is it what they're capable of doing, but it's what you are capable of, of, um, of, of, of handling and giving feedback on. So it's for you as much as for them. And I, I think you have to um, to be in tune with yourself and then also pay attention. So not just be in tune with yourself, but pay attention to um, how you're feeling. And then definitely, you know, you have to you have to break away. So I don't I don't have any problems taking a break um, and going to do some sort of recreation activity um, and then coming back, um, coming back to the work. Um, it is a lot of, it can be a lot of work, but I find taking breaks um, helps me. 
and Jeannie, have you found anything that helps your musicians kind of take yeah. a step back? Again, I, I, it kind of is up to the teacher, but I, for me, I like the um, ability to have a little bit of time in between students so I can, whether it's return a text to my kids or answer a business call or something else that I need to return for me to have this like a little breather in between students, that helps me. Um, it doesn't always work if people have students back to back and they want to smush it in, they can do that. But for me, that doesn't work. So I try to spread it out, have a little bit of time to just breathe in between. And I think, um, like April said, just be patient with yourself, know when you need a break and take the break. Um, there are times, especially in the beginning, the first 30 days where I would hit a wall at six o'clock and it, that would be it. That's all I had. And I just, I felt guilty. I was like, I'm a musician. I should stay up till 11 and get the, you know, I felt guilty, but I think, uh, I just finally had to resolve, uh, be resolved in the sense that I needed that break just to take a break even if it was just for a couple hours and then do a few more things to follow up. But just listen to your head and your body and just say, when you need a break, take a break. And um, that it's okay to do so because these are different times. These aren't like, it's not like it was before. And um, it's okay to, you're grieving the loss of a lot of different things. So just take the time you need um, and, and still, because if, you, if you're not happy or healthy, then you're not going to be able to teach and be inspiring to a kid either. So it's extremely important that, that we're in a good place. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are taking on guilt of not being able to do things the way uh, they were done before. So taking that step back and having that kind of uh, checkpoint in your head that this isn't normal and I know it's not normal and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's all good advice. Um, as we run down on time, I wanted to kind of go down the line, starting with you, Karen, um, and ask each of the three of you what, uh, for you guys specifically, what you would consider a successful uh, digital lesson or components of a digital lesson program. Uh, well, uh, I think you measure success in a digital and an online music program <clears throat> uh, in your students' uh, progress, even though it might be a different rate of progress. And you measure it in how successful, again, I keep coming back to the word community, you can keep that community spirit uh, online. Uh, and I, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, next year's experiences will not all be online and that, you know, we will have, we will be able to, at least for part of the time, have one-on-one -on -one in person lessons. Uh, and, but those are the two things that I strive for. Um, and, and I would also like to say, um, I, I so admire uh, my colleagues who are here on this call, um, I think that you are superheroes uh, in all of the t all of the students you've been able to reach during this time. Um, you know, these this this is Atlanta music, and uh, this is um, extraordinary. I don't know whether it's it's successful in other places, but I know that we're having success this really strange time. Uh, and finally, I would say that I hope that we communicate to our students the purpose of the arts in such a, um, in such a, a, a an upside down, um, perilous time in our, in our history um, for, for several reasons. Uh, it, in this time, I hope we can teach them the value of the arts and how important it is for expression and to have them express themselves through what we can teach them. Absolutely. Anything anyone else would like to add as far as some markers of success? Yeah, well, I, I definitely agree with 
with you, Karen. Um, I think the marker for success is if the students are improving. Um, and, and so I don't think that changes um, because we're online. Um, and I would also say a marker for success would be if the student seems um, enthusiastic or excited about, about what, they're, what they're learning. Um, and then I, I think one, one thing that's a positive thing about this online situation that we find ourselves in um, is that it's an opportunity to get into the student's practice environment at home. Um, and so, and I think that's where the work takes place for the student to really um, make progress on the instrument. So um, I think that's a very positive thing about this time. And I would say, and I would encourage um, educators out there that are on using the online format to hone in on that and try to capitalize on being in the student's practice environment um, as much as possible and try to come up with ways, put yourself in their situation um, and come up with ways to challenge them and guide them um, to have the most, uh, the most conducive practice environment for success as possible, so. I would agree with all that. I hope you can't not agree with that. It was all great stuff. Um, you know, usually the following week after a lesson is when you see their progress and that's great. But to me, um, the best part of even the online uh, teaching, and this is privately, of course, I don't do classrooms, but for private teaching, um, that little moment when you're a student and you go to hit the, the end part of your video and the smile on their face right before it's over, that's the sign for me that we had a successful lesson or a su successful time. They wanted to see that normal time. It's just that one little smile. If I see that, and they all do it, boys, girls, I all do it. And if I see it, I know we accomplished something. Usually we'll end up seeing the, the, the playing side of it the following week, but that day, I know we did something good that day right there in that little smile that happens right before they hit the end button. That's a great point. Um, and I would like to piggyback on something Karen say and just thank all three of you guys again. I think y'all have all been superheroes um, as we've been going through this difficult time. Um, I can't tell all three of you how many compliments we've had come through our office on what you guys have done to kind of help the music educator community here in Atlanta. Um, and I think we have done a really good job of seeing each other through this. Um, and continue to see each other through this to the end. Um, so I think that is about all the time we have for tonight. Um, but Karen, Jeannie, Averill, thank you so much for joining us for this night school at the hall. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to our office. Um, I am happy to pass along the message to any of these three or um, anyone on our organizing task force that can help. Um, if you call our office number 404-873-2033, I am always the person that answers. Um, and I'm more than happy to connect with resources, answer questions, uh, track down anything uh, musicians, union or not, artists, anyone needs at this trying time right now. Um, so thank you guys again. I do want to encourage everyone as we move forward to uh, remember to take care of themselves. Um, Right now it's a very perilous time and there are safety standards and CDC guidelines that everyone should be following. Um, and to do your homework um, as we transition into more in-person stuff. Um, our local will hopefully be putting out some more information here soon on some safety tips to keep in mind as things move back in person. Um, but as far as digital learning, I think you guys have answered a lot of uh, common questions and given a lot of great tips for people that are starting to navigate this new territory. Um, thank you, Brian. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Thank you guys again. Um, for anyone looking for updates on everything uh, musician related in Atlanta or COVID-19, visit our Facebook page, um, which is just facebook.com slash Atlanta Federation of Musicians. 
or visit our website at www.atlantamusicians.com. Um, again, our direct phone number, office hours Monday through Friday, 10 to 4, 404-873-2033. Um, Always happy to have a conversation with you guys, or you can email me at office at atlantamusicians.com. Um, for now, I think we will call this the end of our session, um, but we look forward to bringing some more night school programming to you guys in the very near future.